February 2023, we bring issue two of Living Proof Magazine, a printed magazine by Angel and Z Radio, available exclusively through our Patreon. Issue two of Living Proof Magazine features New York's LNE crew, Deceive Smart Crew, Brian Anderson, 454, and Set KRT. Issue two will only be available for the month of February 2023 and will never be rerun after February. Living Proof Magazine will drop periodically throughout the year and is sent to our Patreon members. Issue 2 features an in-depth interview from Deceive's Smart Crew with photos from Deceive's personal collection, including landmark spots that have been long since buffed. It also features a long-format interview with New York's l e Crew, an interview from the legendary Set KRT, sketches and writings from Brian Anderson's personal notebook, music selections from 454, and more. Living Proof Issue 2 is only available through our Patreon for the month of February 2023, will be sent to our Patreon members, and will never be rerun. Members gain access to our Patreon library featuring interviews from Ichabod YME, Dessa MTA, Curve TGE, videos like All We Got Is Us 2, Savvy OTR, Jedi Fives, You Win Some, You Lose Everything, Rain interviews from Cheek and You Won't, and more. As always, immense thank you to anybody who supports the show in any way. Enjoy the episode and peace. Hey, this is Claw Money, and you're listening to Angel and Z, sponsored by Art Primo. What is Art Primo, you ask? How dare you? Art Primo is a graffiti shop that was started by writers for writers in Seattle in 2001, and they have stayed true to their roots for over 20 years. Offering everything from caps to inks to paint to refillable mops, they got nibs, they got jibs, they got caps, solids, zines, books, and more. And their how-to videos and YouTube channel are legendary. Art Primo strives to keep their prices low and quality high, hand pouring all of their mops and inks in their Seattle warehouse. Shipping orders on the same day and their site is a source of information for all types of writing tools. Tools for what? Tools for the revolution. Well, we we have this this, this, uh, innate desire to just understand. Yeah. And um, sometimes when we get into levels of understanding, it could get scary. Mm. And then uh, if we let fear sort of take over and we stay into that sort of headspace of that, uh, we, we then are comforted by control. Um, it, what would happen if we just let the, the native species of, the, of this part of America be what it wants to be? You know, we're, we're often fighting it back. Mm. We see some of it as a menace. Um, you know, coming through the cracks of a of a sidewalk. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this guy. There's this guy I follow on Instagram that that is a real advocate. He's in Alabama. He's an advocate for uh, uh, respecting native plant species uh, for ecosystems in in your in your areas. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, he's just so, like he like I I when I I was a real toy when it came to like planting things and stuff like that and. Another byproduct of COVID is I was able to put more love into my home space. Uh, being coming from graffiti, I fell into these sort of addictive cycles of just constantly being on the road, wanting to just sort of discover myself through discovering new places. Um, and 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 all of it. And and in my when I moved to uh, Paris in in 2019. I went there with a mission to sort of keep my head down and paint. I felt that there was just a real mood in the air. You know, Donald Trump was president. Uh, Tensions were just becoming a little bit heightened. And you could just sense, you know, like it'd be like if you were in a, it'd be like if you were in a, in a bar and there's a bunch of different people around. Sometimes you could sort of sense like, yo, there's like a real kind of, bad vibe. You could tell when shit's about to pop off, you know? Mm -hmm. And I felt that that time, the summer of 2019, I could really feel that we were on the cusp of like, like an energetic shift. And, and the more I would turn my energy within myself, the more I would get these intuitive confirmations that yes, certainly some shit's about to pop off. You know, nobody likes this motherfucker that's president, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and all this other stuff. Like sometimes we just have to let it out on ourselves and and you know one end of ourselves is taking out taking it out on another end of ourselves 
Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, I got this intuitive hit to to get over to France and keep my head down and not get into the social scene and all that kind of stuff. And I liquidated my life in, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I had a one day studio sale. You know, I was like, oh shit, how am I going to get enough money to go over and move to I remember that. a foreign yeah, country? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, and how do you do that on your own, uh, you know, pursuing a, a career as, as a professional artist? You know, you, 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 you find, you, you keep landing those, those tricks, you know, it'd be like a graffiti writer wanting to get a filling off on a particular mm-hmm. corner. You know, it's like, oh shit, am I going to be able to get this or am I not going to get it? And when you get it, you're like, you just find that you keep getting it. And that's when maybe sometimes with graffiti bombers, we get a little cocky or we just like, we just feel, we expect that rhythm to continue. And then sometimes we don't, just, we get checked a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I, I went over there and I decided to liquidate my life and have a studio sale. Mm-hmm. I let people into my studio and yeah, one day I, I made like $36,000 in one day and I was like, fuck. It was much better to go that route than to be nickel and diamond and, and stressing about how I'm going to generate money. I came mm-hmm. up with a creative solution. What made you um, want to make that change? Did you just feel like you needed a new environment or what, you know? Well, uh, next week I'll be 44 years old. Um, Happy birthday. I, well, well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I was... I've been just sort of wandering uh, this world uh, with the excuse of of graffiti, you know. It's so wonderful to find something that we enjoy pursuing enough uh, to have common interests with strangers, um, to, you know, put ourselves in places that we've never been before. Uh, Yeah, I just went on a a rhythm of, of discovering myself through understanding... Um, this world through painting graffiti and play in the in in the most undesirable places of cities. You know, uh, I'd go to a city and and never go to some of the tourist attractions, but I'd be in in cutty back alleys or on some train tracks or being in this place or that place and dealing with people at odd odd hours. Um, yeah, it really, it really. Gets, it puts you in a position of seeing the world from an outside perspective mm-hmm. in some ways and also a, a, a mindset where rules are, are optional. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you learn so much around curving uh, 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 through the, the, the norms or, or the standards that are sort of set by society. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very dysfunctional. I, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, born in Brooklyn. I grew up, in, I grew up on Staten Island. I'm one of these Brooklyn people that moved over to Staten Island. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, started writing graffiti on Staten Island at 12. My home life was a little disorganized. Uh, I felt displaced. Um, I was looking for something, and at 12, I found graffiti. Uh, and in some ways, I, I think that we're like horses. You know, um, when we're when we're when we're kids, when we're babies, our, our spirits are wide open. Mm. You know, and, and through the course of being uh, a teenager, you, you got to grow up or being an adult or being a, a parent or being a this or being a that. Uh, sometimes we lose that connection mm-hmm. uh, to imagination, yeah. to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see those things as childish. And for the few of us that, that are able to take something from childhood and bring it into our adult years, I feel like in some ways uh, we kept that spirit alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did, and it was graffiti. Yeah, I like to draw before, you know. But, 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 but about those lawns in France, I, I let some of my lawn do its thing. I create yeah. these patches, and I noticed that it, it's, it's more than the species growing. It, it, it creates places for, for bees to go. Uh, other types of uh, uh, little little bugs and and snails and this thing and that thing, and then my ducks would be eating all of them. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it 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 creates this. It creates places for for birds to get material for nesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we fight that. 
exactly where does um where does france come into play because the way i think of it is like when you when you're doing graffiti and you maybe you're traveling from city to city particularly in america you're meeting like a bunch of writers in a way like graffiti can sometimes be like an antisocial thing but also it can be also very social because you're meeting a bunch of people like you said that you'll have like this common interest with that otherwise you wouldn't meet you're going to all these different places but then you go to like France and uh, assuming that you don't know as many people there, you're kind of getting away from everything you know in America, getting away from even just like our culture here to kind of like, in a way, like isolate yourself. Did you feel that way? And and uh-huh. yeah, so what do you think about it in terms of that? Well, it feels like the things that come into our lives are all sort of like episodic lessons. And if we start to pay attention to the rhythm of some of these things, we might notice patterns. We might notice ourselves keep going through the same lesson again and again and again until we decide that we're ready not to. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it might come in the form of, of what you're attracted to, ending up constantly in the same place or whatever. Um, at 39 years old, I... I went through, well, in my 30s, I started to uh, contemplate things. And even before that, in my 20s, I moved to Los Angeles uh, in 2005. I was 26 years old. And I moved out there with like $400 in my Washington Mutual account. And I said, well, fuck it. I dropped out of college. And I said, well, I'm going to go out there and do what I love. And I'm going to go do graffiti. I'm going to make art and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to see if it, if it has any legs, you know, I gave myself until I was 30. So from 26 to 30, I was just going to go for it and see if it certainly is something respectable, certainly is something that's a career. And by the time I was 29, I kind of hit that place. I said, well, fuck it. I could always go back to New York and get a job at Home Depot. (laughs) <laughs> you know, or go back to college and get a degree and teach people how to be artists rather than going and trying to figure it out on my own. Mm-hmm. But I did. And, and yeah, that led to me traveling about and pursuing uh, uh, the idea of being myself for a living. And it led me to France. And, and I ended up doing a, a series of solo shows in France, uh, which got more and more serious. And then I had to take art a bit more and more serious and uh i found that to be a a a a wonderful or and connected artist you have to be connected to the work that you create Mm -hmm. it has to be uh like a feeling there just is something sort of in the essence of what it is that comes through so uh, i i paid a lot of attention to that in the art making process and then as i got into some psychedelic stuff and everything like that and started to ponder in these in these repetitive hours of painting you fall into these 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 flow states and in these flow states maybe you go from this state to that state i don't know what they're called theta or or whatever it is uh you get into these places and when you get into these places you know things might be pondered uh and, and maybe you might switch from from thinking to feeling you know and uh yeah i got into that i got into I was never into drugs growing up. Uh, I was very hesitant. Never done cocaine to this day. Never done heroin or these things. Uh, I was always really cautious. I, I grew up in environments where people would go down those routes, family that would go down those routes. And, uh, yeah, I didn't want to do any of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, when I got into psychedelics, things started to come up in that. And at uh, 39 years old, I had my little what I, you know, my little midlife crisis of some kind, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much a crisis as it more was like, you know, an opening up to the, the, the possibility of, of, of what I am or what I am becoming, mm-hmm. you know, as, as, as we're all kind of in motion. Yeah. yeah. No, um, I mean, now that we're on the topic of psychedelics, um, you know, I have my own experiences with that and, you know, my own story. And I think that if you, go into psychedelics with just i don't know like in with respect and knowing that they are a teacher and that you're not just using it for 
like a party drug or just to go out and hang out and whatever um and the more and more you respect it and the more you take it i feel like it's almost as if like it sends you these messages that are um mm -hmm. you know not one you can put just like with an alphabet but it's more like of a feeling and an mm -hmm. intuition you mm -hmm. know what i mean because even me personally growing up i was just so isolated and alone for the majority of my life because my father passed that you know when i was at a young age mm -hmm. and i was just you know just like angry at the world kind of you know and uh honestly after doing psychedelics um and i was always hesitant against that stuff because i was like i don't know where my mind would wander i'm kind of intimidated almost by them because the stereotype of them from the majority of the population is just that it's just like too much it's like mm -hmm. some crazy thing that you don't want to go down that road mm -hmm. And, um, but it's funny how it almost kind of, you could say nurtures you if, if it happens correctly. And, um, you know, nowadays I do them less, mm -hmm. um, because I just feel like you said earlier in the show, there is an energy shift. And I feel like when I become vulnerable in that state, I feel that energy shift even more and more nowadays. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, and it can mix with, um, you know just like almost this thing with good versus evil and uh i feel it just deeply in that state so you know being more cautious in mm -hmm. that so uh well what do we when we do a psychedelic you know what what are we what are we doing what are we connecting to you know what you know what what is that mm -hmm. uh, i mean where where do all psychedelics come from the, the ground no the, the earth. ground the earth yeah yeah and then when we have these experiences with the earth in this way uh is it is it just us going into us our physical bodies you know what, what are we what are we connecting to that mm -hmm. what is that you know uh, it's a it's a big open subject yeah, there. yeah and maybe it, it, at a certain point it extends outside of the possibility of ourselves yeah it might even extend outside the possibility of of the earth as being a conscious entity mm-hmm and we are all the little sort of figments of, yeah. of the earth experiencing yeah. this. The critters in the grass yeah. and the lawn. <laughs> we are we are the, the, the children of, of this mm. planet. And as we grow in, in consciousness and, and are recycled back into it, uh, I feel the earth grows as mm. well. And, and when we go into there through all of these different methods, you know, even drinking some mint tea where... We're uh, uh, brewing uh, uh, the essence of, of this plant and, mm -hmm. and consuming it and, and, and it having an effect on our bodies for a period of time. Not psychoactive, but, you know, coffee, you know, can take you there, you know. Any of these things, um, vitamin C. I'm drinking cranberry juice right now. Yeah. You know, uh, I have some sort of discomfort on my side that i just try to uh, hypothesize until right. i get around to an urgent care <laughs> you know what i mean and, yeah, yeah. and i'm hoping that you know uh, uh cranberry juice is the ticket for whatever yeah, yeah. body part is is over there. i don't <laughs> yeah. know i've just been so busy running around the world being fascinated by being alive and you know exploring these ideas like mm -hmm. like like w what is imagination you know, when, when we when we are create things, you know, uh, where is that coming from? Is it coming from things in our brain firing off and that's it? You know, where did, where did, where does imagination come from? Where does creativity come from? <laughs> Somewhere in what we yeah. call the conscious mind, I guess. Okay. Or maybe or maybe yeah. the unconscious mind, which no one has seemed to find yet, you know. Mm. Um you said you you grew up like not really doing and kind of avoiding like for lack of a better term like drugs and i remember in, in some interview that i was listening to you of you speak you were saying how um you didn't do psychedelics for a while because of uh you were just hesitant for whatever reason yeah um when was the first time you did it and uh how did that come about well uh you know i like i said i grew up around people sort of losing themselves to addiction you know all forms of addiction and uh it made me you know, weary of that, you know, and then also, uh, I think one time I, I was living on Staten Island and me and, me and uh, uh, my friend John, we, we bought some acid in the park. We were playing handball and bought some acid in the park and it was $5 for hits. And uh, we 
took these hits and we went to the movies and we went to the movies and we saw Son-in-Law with Paulie Shaw and then we went into Snow White. And then after that, we highest kites walking into car, cars, almost getting hit by cars. And we went home and to my house. He slept over my house and we watched Psychic Friends Network infomercial and we drew all night. And I was like, wow, this is really deep, you know. And after that, I, I, I think I was 14. I said, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this mm-hmm. because I don't want to lose my mind. I'm still growing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like maybe it's good to give your body enough time to acclimate to being here on earth until it's 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 fully grown Mm -hmm. you know and then from there you know um you know i think that even with alcohol you know they try to curb you know teenagers from becoming alcoholics to give children enough time to grow Mm -hmm. uh, to grow not just uh, physically but also mentally and and perhaps if they're lucky spiritually but by the time we're in our 20s, it's it seems out of place and, and odd for you not to drink alcohol, yeah. to be in a bar and and like, oh, why? You're not going to drink? What's wrong with you? You don't yeah. you don't drink? And you're like, all right, fine. You know, I'm going to fucking drink. All right. And you just sit there and you're holding this beer. And I think that people are doing this to sort of get that liquid courage and be able to mix with people or, or there's maybe some awkward or inadequacies mm. that where maybe sometimes we're not feeling comfortable in who we are or we have this really distorted egoic view of who we are and and then these people these knuckleheads that I hang out with in New York City they all want to get drunk and fight each other or fight someone else or something like that and then you're involved in all this bullshit and then and then after you get all drunk like that you go out and write graffiti and then and then and then you're getting that sort of skewed thing and you're just impatient and you're paying over this person and then you're dealing with all this nonsense and people are getting jumped and people are getting stabbed and people are getting killed and all this nonsense over something that's really fucking stupid and then after a while, this shit gets a little played out. That shit gets a little corny. You know, that, that rah-rah shit, you know, uh, Wu-Tang was dope in the 90s and all. But, like, I can't I can't rock to that radio station forever. I'm not going to ride that vibe into the sunset. You know, uh, it just, it's not healthy. You know, and, and so in my 30s, again, I was very weary. I... I it landed at uh, 2011, I was 32, and I was painting graffiti at that time just habitually. Like, I fell into the mode of just living out of luggage. And, like, as soon as I'd get home, my fridge be empty. I was living in L.A., and my fridge was empty. The toilet bowl hadn't been flushed in so long, the water went all the way down. Mm. And I was like, and someone's like, yo, you want to go to, you want to go to uh, France? You want to go to yo, let's go over to, to Florida. Let's go to this place. Let's go to that place. Let's go to China. Yo, you want to go to China? I got a free trip to China. Or somebody reach out and be like, yo, I want you to come down to Mexico City. And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and and one of these things, I was painting some graffiti event at in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I was with a couple of my close friends. And we drove up to Austin and we were at a house party and people were sniffing coke and smoking weed and drinking and i don't sniff coke i really don't give a fuck about drinking but i'm drinking the corona to fit in and i'm hanging out with my friends as they're doing their cocaine politics and then there were some people playing CeeLo in the kitchen so i decided to start playing CeeLo in the kitchen and it was 20 dollar hands and i was like damn this is i don't want to be dropping 20 dollars all the time playing these mm. fucking passionate people about playing CeeLo and they were brewing mushroom tea and then uh, my b- close friend was like, yo, do this. I was like, no, 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 I don't really want to do that. I don't want to do it. He's like, just fucking do it, man. Stop being a pussy. And I was like, all right, man. So I drank the tea and I found it to be different than alcohol. Instead of sort of numbing into, you know, whatever state it is, uh, feeling disconnected, I felt a bit more connected. I started thinking about things in, in a fun way. I felt like it was, it was like a positive stimulant. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it was in a social setting, so I was around a bunch of people. Things felt weird. Um, I said, oh, I should try this again. And then I started going out when I, when I moved back from California. I lived for eight years in California, and then I 
moved back to New York to sort of connect with family again and stuff like that. And I missed New York. And I landed in New York and I found that I was exotic in New York. That uh, all these people that I'd be hanging out with them, none of them were native New Yorkers. Like, oh, wow, you talk funny. Oh, you sound like a real New Yorker. And nobody was from New York. Once you get into uh, the north end of Brooklyn, uh, it's all transplants. You know, so I, I just felt this desire to hang out with native New Yorkers. So I moved to Kensington, Brooklyn. I don't know if you know where that is. Yeah, yeah. I was living in Kensington, regular ass Brooklyn. By Prospect Park, right? Yeah, yeah. I was living in regular ass Brooklyn. And um, I said, you know what? Maybe I could find out who my father is because I think that shit bothers me. I think that a lot of my my cynicism, a lot of the the sort of fuck you attitude that I have maybe comes from that disposition. And uh, I try to look up who he was and all that kind of stuff. But there was no fine in this dude. The motherfucker's elusive. Ain't that right, Daddy O? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he ran a he ran a cab stand in um in Borough Park. Wow. Uh there was a cash front operation. <laughs> I said, Oh, I, I my mom told me that he, he worked in a cab stand and I thought maybe I could look that up with tax records mm-hmm. and, and he said he said, Oh I said, Why? He's like that was a fugazi operation. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a movie. Yeah, it was a front. <laughs> Did that? What they do in there? Did they do anything? It was just a cash business. Yeah, there was no like fights or nothing. It was just cash business. Was it like money laundering? Well, I don't know. money laundering. <laughs> yeah, they just handled cash. That's what they did. But um, yeah, uh, psychedelics sort of came in at a time that helped me to sort of get past a lot of the cynicism, some of the jadedness that sort of comes in when our spirits are broken. You see? That sometimes we lose connection with imagination. And, and imagination is certainly rooted in spirituality. And, and, and religions, they become so hardened, they yeah. just become stern recipes on how to feel. You know, how to, how to feel. Mm-hmm. Not, not to explain and rationalize, but to feel. Yeah. And I think that's... That's spirituality. That's imagination. You just go off a of feeling, yeah. you know, like someone like Bruce Lee or, or, uh, or Mike Tyson or, or, or a, you know, a painter, or any anyone, mm-hmm. a, a musician. There's a place that we go as human beings that sort of steps out of recipe, mm-hmm. that steps out of technique, and it, it goes into something else. Yeah. It's 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 a feeling, yeah. and some of us. We just we just have it, or we we find ways to connect to it, yeah. you know. And yeah, religion has a way of sort of uh, numbing that down, and so does alcohol, mm-hmm. and so does ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that's the thing with um, psychedelics as well that I notice is it also creates that connection with each other as well in the mm-hmm. moment. Um, I remember I was I was um, I took a you know a relatively high dose in my friend's uh, bedroom, and we were just sitting there, and I remember just feeling this oneness with the universe, mm-hmm. you know, just with people, especially in particular. It's so funny. I went through this like moment where I felt like I was sitting on his like wooden floor mm-hmm. and I like put myself in the shoes of someone in prison right now. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy shit, dude, this is insane. Like I truly felt like I was that person sitting in a cell in that situation in their life. And then it transitioned into me thinking about my cousin that I know grew up with like a bad drug addiction Mm -hmm. and you know he's bettering himself now and trying Mm -hmm. and trying and like you know and I literally picked up my phone and I haven't talked to him in like two years and I literally texted him like dude I love you so much that's all I said in the Mm -hmm. message he probably was like what the fuck Mm -hmm. you know and I like if it was emotional you know Mm -hmm. and it just felt you feel this connection and you're like I start thinking about my mother and my sister and like Mm -hmm. you start putting yourself in their shoes and what they've been through in their life I'm like wow that is mm-hmm. something else that is like people really go through some shit you know mm-hmm. um everyone everyone mm-hmm. is it's truly crazy you, yeah. you're going into these 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 places that are that are emotional for you you know uh so it it it, it has a way of 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 uh of inviting us into feelings you know there, there's thought involved it, it it's 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 inviting thought into an emotional space. And I feel that emotional space uh, is, is wise and, 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 and conscious. 
and and I think that we're all tethered to this 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 space that blurs outside of the lines of logic of measurement of mind. Kids have it. Uh, one of the things I wrote the other day. Uh, 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 logic is the first thing to go in an old folks home. Mm. You know, you can spend your life being as logical and controlling and, and fearful as you like. But we come into this world, let go of logic, and we, you know, exit this world letting go of logic. Yeah. yeah. And we return to that place of feelings and, and, and possibility that's outside of explanation. And we can sort of be in that for a while. And when we're in that for a while, maybe we could get past the fear. We, we lull ourselves into that. I feel that we get there. We get to that same place, whether it be through experimenting with psychedelics or through meditation or through sleep or through repetitive action or through joy, bliss. I feel that all of these ways that we have to sort of calibrate ourselves that we're all going to this place we just call it different things you know uh, uh, sleep and meditation i feel we're going to the same place we're going to what the the, the subconscious yeah. you know uh, when you get when you get rem sleep and you're there you, you you're resetting you know you're, you're like the iphone that just starts glitching out what do you do when your iphone's glitching out what do you do Turn yeah. it off, turn it back on. Turn it yeah. off, turn it back on. You know, and, and if you don't, you know, things get delinquent. And same thing with us too. Um, we get, we might get rooted in a, in a mindset that this is it, that this physical world is all there is. And if you want to travel from A to B, you got to get your ass in a physical spaceship and mm -hmm. be like Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever it is and and and, and move your body. You're so, we're, we're so afraid of, 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 of detaching from our bodies or detaching from, from wealth. You know, the concept of, of owning land is, is, is crazy, you know, especially the system that we set up. I say, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to own me some land. I'm going to, I'm going to go buy some land in, in Virginia. All right, cool. I, I bought the land. Uh, I spent uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars getting me a big property, and I built myself a big house. I own that. Do I? Do I really own it? You know, uh, I'm 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 obligated to pay uh, the United States of America what? You know, taxes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, other miscellaneous fees, and if I want to change anything in my house, I have to get a permit. Yeah, and if I ever fall short of giving them their cut. For me to exist in, in, in this country, they can take my, my property, they can yeah. take my house. So did I ever really own it? You know, uh, let's say, let's jump ahead, you know, uh, 1,000 years in the future. Will the United States be around? I, I, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be here in this form. Who knows what it would be? You know, so, so let's, let's get into facts. I'm not going to be here in this form. 1,000 years from now, now let's say when I pass away, this body passes away, uh, you know, my maybe my family would be like, oh my God, Joe's gone away, you know, uh, what are we going to do? They're going to take me down to a funeral home, right? And they're going to say, okay, do you want to embalm him or not embalm him? Do you want to cremate him? You know, which way do you want to dish up his body? So if you embalm me and you put me in the ground and I'm in this box that's preserved, and, you know, maybe it'll keep my body intact for X amount of time or whatever. And maybe it'll slowly decompose, you know, like these Egyptian mummies, you know, that there's still uh, maybe hair or fingernails yeah. or traces of, of cartilage or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And then you have people that just go in the ground and, you know, maybe they're wrapped in cloth or something like that. And they just become some bones and eventually those bones go away. I mean, does it just go away into nothing? The, the physical body or, or does it get recycled recycled yeah. it gets recycled you know the 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 best stuff on earth grows out of decay and shit you know yeah. that's why we fertilize our 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 gardens with uh bones and 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 guts and 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 decayed plants and everything yeah. you know uh fertilizer what do you what do you think about um 
I guess, city life, because a lot of the stuff that you're saying is bringing a lot of stuff into my mind. Mm-hmm. One of them being like, um, there's this, uh, there's this like martial artist, uh, Crone Gracie. And he talks about like f- having like his day go by intuition rather than like a set plan. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. which made me, th- which you saying about like feeling rather than thinking mm-hmm. made me think of that. And then, um, but, but the thing is, it's like, you know, it's like we live in a, kind of like a repetitive cycle, not just living in a city, but pretty much living almost anywhere in, in this world. We mm-hmm. have to fit into this mold of we have to pay the taxes, we have to do this, we have to do that. And um, there's almost like, it seems like no time for living mainly off of feeling more so you have to like make these rational decisions. Mm-hmm. You have to choose this, choose that, and you have to choose now. And like my whole life, um, I was extremely antisocial growing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and hearing you guys talk about like, I've never done any psychedelics, any drugs, Mm -hmm. any, anything. Um, I was into like, just, you know, punk and hardcore scene and Mm -hmm. super like, like us against you type of thing. Mm -hmm. No sign of like, uh, this whole world's unified feeling the oneness and everything. I didn't want to hear anything about oneness. Mm -hmm. Um, so it just seems like, and you know, a lot of people feel that way, whether it be in politics or whether it be in like my belief versus yours, my religion versus yours, there's so much like, uh, strata, tra- like just like separation between mm-hmm. like us as humans. Uh, but every time I've ever heard someone talk about psychedelics, whether it be you or you or Mike Giant or whoever it is, Brian De La Torre, like mm-hmm. whenever we're talking to them, there's always like this like th- common theme about like unity and feeling and just like understanding, mm-hmm. uh, which I feel like in our modern day is kind of hard to come by. Uh, getting back to the whole city thing, like. Cause it makes sense to live your day off of like intuition and feel like what feels right today rather than like what I must do today. Because if I don't, then I don't have money to let's say pay my taxes. Um, you living like, let's say right now you're in New York. Mm-hmm. How do you, as a person who is like seeking some sort of understanding and like always trying to like be more complete as a whole, uh, how do you deal with that when you're mm-hmm. living in this type of environment? Like, Cause it seems to me like a lot of figures who have done stuff like that, like, um, even just like Eastern religion, Eastern religious figures, they move and they, they go elsewhere mm-hmm. where they can truly live like off of feeling, mm-hmm. um, where they can be in, in a type of solitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you feel that that was a reason that you went to France or how do you feel living in, in this? Well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, all of these different places in the world, there, where, wherever we are, we're a product uh, of of that environment in in some form. New York City is like a radio station. It's like Hot ninety seven or something like that. You know what I mean? And and maybe even New York City has a few very various forms. You know, like think of it like the radio. You guys, you know, the regular ass radio yeah, yeah. in New York City. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where it's at now, but you got. CBS FM, classic rock, which is which is oldies, mm. and oldies is now bridged into probably like the nineties, mm. you know. Uh, then you got Hot ninety seven, you got uh, Q one hundred four point three, which is classic rock, mm. and then you got uh, uh, some of those other ones like uh, you know I don't know if they have one hundred three five KTU. I don't oh know yeah, that's... ten ten wins. Yeah, well, a Z one hundred, which is main middle of middle of the mall shit, Z one hundred. You know, these are all the the go-to radio stations that sort of define who the worker bees are, you know, the, the people that just want to pop on the radio, you know, and, and they'll listen to that same Led Zeppelin song a quadrillion times in a month, and it just gets drilled in. You know these songs? Like, there's just certain songs that you just can't play independently. Like it's very hard for me to play independently a Rolling Stone song because it's just on the radio every goddamn day. You know, uh, I know the words to Backstreet Boys songs because I've never independently played a Backstreet song. But that one like, uh, uh, tell me why, ain't <laughs> yeah, nothing yeah. but a party, yeah, yeah. ain't nothing but a mistake tell me <laughs> i know that whole fucking song and i was in la once i was in the frozen food section in in in, in um in uh john's and uh that song was on and it was it was nostalgic at that point even though i i cringed at it same thing with new kids on the block i know their fucking songs too because it was so 
just sort of saturated in my environment that I and they're so jingly. You, you know what I mean? Like you, you, you can't escape it at that point. And, that, and, and I think that that's what happens when you live in a city is there's just a particular vibe that you just cannot escape. Mm. You could avoid it all day long. You could be uh, introverted and all that kind of stuff. You could protect yourself. You could line your, your, your doorways with, uh, uh, you know, chalk and, and have Palo Santo jamming all day and everything like that. And you could create your oasis in your home. But when you go out into that world, you must be an aspect of that world. And cities, you know, uh, such a such a tremendous entity. And we are all the little cogs of that entity, sort of defining what it is. You know, when I was driving, I didn't want to drive the car into Manhattan. You know, and, you know, you know, I'm not dealing with fucking parking and traffic yeah. and all that nonsense. So I took the train with Daddy O over there, and it's there was this moment where you know when um, the Q train is going over the bridge uh, from Brooklyn to Manhattan, and you're seeing you know some of these construction projects completed because you can tell in the nighttime skyline that there's more uh, lights on and and it's changing the shape. Of, of New York City and you're looking at the city of the future and the making and you say well here I am at this point in time experiencing this 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 shift from one age into another mm -hmm. you know uh, the mascot for the age that we're in now what what age are we in now guys do you know the age that we're in now no. the in astrology and all this kind of stuff uh, the age that we're in now is the age of Pisces. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the figures for Pisces are their fish, yeah? And the mascot for Pisces is the fisherman, who's also a carpenter somehow, Jesus Christ. Mm. You know, uh, we're in the year 2023, and they seem to somehow tie in his birthday to the, to the restarting of the clock, where you have B.C. and mm -hmm. A.D. or C.E. now it's called. Um, Jesus is the mascot of this age that we're in and we're going into another one. Mm -hmm. And it seems like now every 100 years we're going from one revolution to another. Mm -hmm. You know, 150 years ago we were going into the Industrial Revolution. And what did that do to Manhattan? What did that do to the Manhattan skyline? Now here we are, you know, right, you know, the fear of the, of the new millennia, the Y2K, I don't know if you, you guys around for the y2k concerns and fears and we went into the internet and america online and, and uh having websites and all that kind of stuff and then cell phones after 9 11 everybody ran out and got cell phones even though they didn't work on 9 11 everybody went out and got cell phones and now every single person has a phone everyone every single person is accessible uh every single person has a catalog of information attached to them we all have to store images. Oh, everybody's a photographer now. Everybody's a documenter of their lives, more or less. It's insane to not have a phone or, or, or to just have a flip phone or, or to not have an iPhone, you know, to be a creative person and have an Android. Like, yo, what's up with that dude, man? You know, we, we're kind of, th th we're going through another revolution. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's called. Is it called something? What is this tech revolution called now? I have no idea, but there, like, there's different ideas of what's coming, like Web three, or I mean, if if you follow um, and try to even keep track of the new technological revolutions and the new technologies that are coming into our lives, you almost can't believe it. I almost can't believe it because every day, at least three or four times a day, there's some groundbreaking new invention that mm -hmm. you could easily see completely like changing the the way we live our lives, changing like the world as we know it. And there's every day, mm -hmm. multiple times a day. You got to think to yourself, like, this is too much. Um, mm -hmm. That's my opinion, at least. Like, I'm all for, I think technology has improved our lives in some ways and not so much in other ways. Um, but I definitely think that everything has a limit or a point that you like, should, should should let it be and let it relax at. And, and I think that in terms of that, it's like, it's, it's really like crazy. And it seems like, um, I don't know what is coming is like for some people, 
and then like not for others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if it's not for you, then to be honest, like it seems like you'll just be left behind. And that's like how I feel. Like I see like, uh, like my one of like my grandma who passed, like she mm-hmm. couldn't keep up with the technology and it's like, she was literally living not in this world anymore, like in her house in the past. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well for us, then that's going to be even faster because it's changing so quickly that it's just, you know, ridiculous. Mm-hmm. What happens when we step outside of ourselves? What do you mean? <laughs> in, in all possible ways. Uh, we're, we're, we're born into a, a, an organic planet, you know, uh, like, like when you were going through those periods of discovering yourself through sobriety mm-hmm. and celebrating it in, in, uh, you know, a, 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 co- a common musical sound, you know, like hardcore music, um, and, and, and maybe finding positive aspects of that, that, mm-hmm. that empower you, um, and you question the or, or reject the ideas of oneness, you know. But but for a fact, you know, we're we are earth. You know, everything in the room is earth. The, the cups and the microphones and me and you and we're all earth, right? Mm-hmm. Is there anything in this room that's not earth? No. So so for a fact, we're all this one entity, right? Yes. And are we alive or dead? We're alive. Well, we are alive. Uh, You could argue if this is alive. Okay. So the traditional concept of of living, having a heartbeat, having a thought or or whatever it is that we call life, we agree that we're alive. And we're also agreeing in in this, you know, um, understanding that, that you're you and you're you and I'm me and this is this and this thing is that and all that kind of stuff, right? And when we let go of that, that gets a little scary. That gets a little odd. That gets a little threatening. You know, that in some ways, where we all we all know this deep down inside that we are all one. And mm-hmm. then, and then beyond that, we live in in a universe, and that universe might be considered one as well. And that universe belongs to a sea of stuff that we cannot put, even understand. And all of these physical things, uh, are made up of non-physical things. Uh, and it's made up of energy and energy ultimately is made up of something too. And then, uh, and then we, 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 it becomes intimidating what to even call that. You know, we say, okay, well, what do you want to call that? Well, fuck that noise. I don't believe in any of that shit. I call it nothing. You know, I call it space. Or I call it uh, uh, God, mm-hmm. you know, and that dirty word God. Uh, I call it God. I call it uh, the universe. I call it uh, 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 creation. You know, no matter no matter which way, you know, you you describe it, it it you're describing the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, because the you know the ultimate form of everything. Everything, the ultimate form of everything is also nothing. Hmm. Because if, if, if something is, is, is completely everything, then there's nothing else to compare it to. So it becomes everything and nothing all in one. And for a fact, all of this sort of totals up to that. That's, that's the best in all of the sort of you know, little journeys within the experience of myself. Uh, I, I go back to that truth, and and that and everything physically is just a, a component of something energetic, and there is a whole universe of energy that exists around us that we cannot see or or measure yet or understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we can feel it. And there are people that maybe have a, a crossover um, uh, tellings of, of things. They say, you know, I stepped outside of myself and I came across this, or I felt this way, or I felt that way. They say, oh, wow, I, I went through that too. Or, and then there are people that write these things down, and there are people that pa- make paintings mm. sort of uh, um, illustrating what these spaces look like. Mm. Or people end up uh, uh, connecting to relatives, or they can. And, and what are those relatives? Are they living, breathing relatives, or are they energetic mm. relatives? Are they a little of both? Mm. Or you feel like you're there with them, but maybe physically you're not. But nevertheless, you feel like you. All these things happen to people, 
And then they come back to, you know, living, breathing, getting on the train and all that kind of stuff. And they, they might dare say it to somebody. They're like, oh shit, yo, you, you fucking do it too many psychedelics. Or, or even without, like some of the most prolific experiences I've had have been completely sober. Yeah. You know, uh, that's just getting on the highway, you know, uh, you know, like doing a, a, a medicine ceremony or something like that. You're, you're getting on the highway and that highway has a soundtrack. Mm -hmm. You know, when you sit down to an ayahuasca medicine ceremony that you've prepared for and uh, are open to mm -hmm. willing uh, to the possibility of letting go of yourself, of your mind and going towards feeling your heart, and then letting go of all of the, the stored memories and pains and things attached to your sense of self and all that. It gets a little blurry after a while, yeah. you know, and you fall back into these places of, mm -hmm. of understanding the interconnectedness of everything mm -hmm. and that we're, we're all contributing to it. And, it, and And it comes out in the things that we feel we invent. You know, our, our egos, they say, oh, Look, look at the society we live in now. Look at all these amazing things that we've done. We created microphones and, <laughs> and uh, we figured out how to, to make coffee and, you know, we smoke cigarettes, you know, and we can have tomatoes in the middle of winter and all that kind of stuff, you know. How do you, how do you feel now, um, you know, after I'm assuming like the, the, I guess like from let's say age zero to let's say age, I'm um, just going to put a number 25. Mm -hmm. You were more so in like graf graffiti mode. Maybe what I would call, I don't know you personally, but what I would call maybe like a pure graffiti mode, like life is about painting. Life is about graffiti. Life mm -hmm. is about, um, you know, getting up and expressing yourself in that way. Then there's maybe a, another stage of your life where you're starting to feel like, maybe starting to enter into and also discover the things that you're talking about right now, uh -huh. talking about unity, talking about like the oneness and everything. And, and just all of these things that maybe like the purest graffiti writer wouldn't normally think of on a day to day uh. basis. They're more so looking at the walls, who's up, who's not, I'm not really thinking about, um, unity. I'm not really thinking about uh, a place as different radio stations. I'm not really thinking about this. I'm more so thinking about graph. And, but today, uh, you do think about that stuff, but you also mm -hmm. still paint graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, where does graffiti fall into your life? Because oh, a lot man. of times, like, especially like me and him talk about this, like we feel like um, sometimes it's hard to relate to our uh, graffiti friends, which don't get me wrong. I have like a lot of love for, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm super grateful for graffiti and, and all the people I've met through it as well. But just like sometimes when maybe you're on slightly different wave, it's, it's mm -hmm. hard to relate because like you said, Maybe you go out, you get you get drunk, you want to fight, and maybe I feel like I have no business doing that anymore. Maybe I feel like, damn, like, am I am I different? Um, do you ever feel like that today? Uh, when sure. You, how do you feel with graffiti? Well, it's it's just about digesting everything, you know. Uh, I I think about that concept of unity because I've been there. I've gone further enough into the idea of me being an aspect of everything by experiencing it. I went to those places when people have what, you know, they might describe as a death and rebirth experience. They might go to that place where they're, where they're disconnected from their sense of self to such an extent that they feel at a loss, you know, the, that reset. And when you go that far out and you return, it, it has a way of, 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 making you sort of ponder that, you know, and, and, and you say, well, wait a second, you know, uh, what was that? And you understand too, that, that all of this is imagined. Another way to describe God and nothing and everything and whatever all the other religions call this is I, I like the one imagination. It's a real kids dig imagination. You know, they're meant to exercise their imagination. I like that one, but they're all the same thing, you know, uh, Imagination, you know, uh, I feel that when we create things, we go to imagination. We, we, we access that, you know, as I was saying before, that our egos, we get caught up in invention. We say, oh, man, you know, uh, human beings, we, we, we invented the Internet, you know, like, pff, that's crazy. You know, like we all, you know, in, in your pocket, 
contains any answer to any trivial question you want. And and whatever's on that phone is also on my phone. That's insane. You know, and and you might have looked at my Instagram stories on the way over and saw I'm bopping around town with my father. You know, and, and that just happened today. You know, uh, we live in that world right now. But I, I feel that this already exists. And it's just we're making it like uh, it's just a it's just a was a microcosm. Mm -hmm. It's just like a smaller version of it. And from from all the sort of wanderings into all of this that I go, I understand that that imagination is an energetic, conscious place, and we all feed it. You know, uh, the, there there are some people that call it uh, the akashic record. You know, uh, and there are other people that just feel it. it. It's beyond a word or something. And I believe that we can sort of, the way in is, is a, so I, I get messages when I go into these things, you know, and, and, and one message I received is I, she said the, the way to go into it is you go to a place without words within yourself. You go to a place without words and you feel a connection. So my, the inner dialogue in, in my mind, I was raised to speak English, is English. So when I go into thinking within myself, I might catch myself using language to decode whatever it is that I'm feeling or thinking or whatever. But the way into, the, what I'm discovering is the way into that is to, for a little while, you let go of language. You just let it go. If I want to think about my foot, I don't say foot in my mind. I go to the foot. And then I imagine into the foot. I imagine into feeling my toe or feeling this or feeling that. And it's a game. I see it as a game. I'm using my imagination. I'm playing the game of letting go of my mind. And when I let go of my mind, I find it kind of works. You know, that you could line up your, your Wi-Fi. Your, 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 they have, what is it, the chakras. Yeah. You know, and you, you get those things moving up and down. And then you get this funny feeling at the top of your head. And then all of a sudden, you're kind of connected to Wi-Fi. You know, you go from 4G LTE, you know, to 5G, and then you're in, you're in Wi-Fi, you know, and you have high-speed Wi-Fi for a while. And then if you continue to just sort of use your imagination and, and, and go to that place with feeling, you could feel yourself so deep into that experience that you let go of yourself for a while. Mm. And the proof is in our ability to sleep at night. When we're sitting in bed, just 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 struggling with thought, it's it's extremely thip, difficult to drift into sleep. You know, I, we've all experienced those nights where we stay up all night because because we can't get out of our heads. But when we can sleep, it's it's when we let go of that for a while, and then all of a sudden our subconscious is active for a while, mm. and I feel that when we go to sleep, we're connecting to that pool of energy. I'm not saying I know for a fact. I didn't get in a spaceship and go there, bro. I'm just saying I felt it, and I go there a lot. And I think that all creators in some form go there a lot. Mm -hmm. All the little nuances that come up when we let go, and I'm like, oh, shit, you discover something. If you have a throw-up and you just keep doing that throw-up, and that throw-up goes from being a formula to a rhythm, when you really get it down, it naturally evolves. Mm -hmm. You know, we see that, you know, you, you could look at a, a, a fill-in you did from 2015 and compare it to now, and you see its, re its evolution. Yeah. You, you see it with all of us, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so, yeah, Wi-Fi, the, the, the same way you would understand Wi-Fi, I feel, is this pool of imagination that we all belong to. Mm -hmm. We go there when we sleep. We feed it mm -hmm. with energy. We're, like, uploading all our dumping all our our, our, yeah. our information to it and then what does it do when we plug if i plugged in my phone to my laptop it'll tell me that there needs to be some update mm -hmm. and then it feeds me with an update and maybe not all that information is is is, is, is visually seen mm -hmm. it's like back-end information it's stuff going to the hard drive mm -hmm. and i feel that's what dreams are that they're, they're feeding the subconscious and, and it slips away. If we don't retain it, it slips away. Oh, man, I, I had this dream about that. Oh, I can't remember it. It's because it's, 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 it's going into ourselves sometimes, and it's giving us a moral lesson, like, like, like a download of something, that 
is, is, is connected to intuition. And when we do things in our life to exercise I- intuition, similar to like being able to do a pull-up, if you can't do a pull-up, well, if you keep attempting to do pull-ups, eventually you could do a pull-up. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you incorporate intuition more into your day-to-day yeah. life, that, that energy becomes mm-hmm. awakened in you. And you, I feel that intuition is also being in tune. It's being in tune with nature. You know, the animals on this planet are, are extremely intuitive. They're extremely connected to the flow of the planet. Yeah. That they can sense things that go outside of our own logic. logic. Of course. Yeah. And they have um, heightened senses. Just take a dog, for example. Mm-hmm. How does it know that, that that car is has that exact person in it two blocks away and it's approaching mm-hmm. and they're running to the door? How do they know that? We can't do that. We don't have a heightened sense like that. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. Imagine what, you know, little insects that we just don't even bother thinking about imagine what they can do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. that we don't know about so and um i just wanted to say like i see a lot in your artwork Mm -hmm. as well um intuition you know what i mean i see a lot of especially your characters or the way your letters flow or the colors it just seems like it's such a freeing thing for you to do you know the way everything flows and how did you was it through psychedelics or was it through what or just hanging out with certain writers or how did you you know, in my opinion, get to this high standard of just cleanliness and style and just colors and just your whole, you know, everything you do in your artwork just has like, you know, a lot could say a high standard, you know. Thank you. Of course. But the the simple answer is being interested Mm -hmm. and being interested in in understanding or or more, you know. when I, when I, you know, before I, before I got into graffiti, I liked to draw like every other kid. Mm. Uh, there were some things that I drew as a young kid that resembled Mickey Mouse or resembled my stepdad's look with his fedora on or something like that. So what did I get? I got praise and it made me feel good. It made me feel like I was doing something special and it made me want to do it more. And I discovered a lot about myself by getting lost in imagination that I could have a blank piece of paper and I could have some crayons or I could have a pencil and I I could create a world in a page. But when we go through puberty and we got to look cool and we got we to gotta sound this way or that way, sometimes we lose connection with who we are for a while. And that's important too and that's fun too. You know, those, those awkward moments you know, that, you know, we, we learn a lot from trauma. You know, we learn a lot from dysfunction. We learn a lot from being bad boys and bad girls. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I appreciate all of that stuff. I I grew up with, be, I, when I was growing up, I was given a dollar and told to go to church. And, you know, my mom didn't want to go to church. She goes to church now. She She feeds the homeless every Sunday at the Salvation Army. Nice. And she loves going there and singing her songs. And, mm. you know, she don't care about the politics of Christianity. She just down with Jesus, <laughs> you know. And she yeah. goes to the Salvation Army, feeds the homeless, hangs out with her girls at the Salvation Army, and they sing songs and, and do a service. Mm-hmm. That's the radio station that she's down with these days. Yeah. You know, but back when I was a kid, she wasn't about that life because she's trying to support a household, trying to navigate the ship and, and figure out, you know, she, she got rushed into adulthood by having children as a teenager. And that's super intimidating, you know, to figure that one out. Um, but when I would go to church, I said, wow, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to learn this thing to be a good boy. I want to be a good boy. I'm going to learn this and all that kind of stuff. And when I started to ask questions, the answers I would getting, I was getting, they were kind of mean spirited. They were kind of frustrated, uh, in their delivery so I was told that I was an atheist as a, as a little kid or, or that I'm going to go to hell or whatever, that I just need to blindly trust this and this and that. And I became a little, a little turned off by religion. Mm-hmm. I became a little turned off by religion, and I associated being religious with being spiritual. I thought it was the same thing. What did I know? It was like, believe this or else. Mm-hmm. You know, and around the same time, around eight years old, I started to have experiences with what I felt to be like people in the room at night, you know? Uh, and it's like, you know, I, I never liked to watch horror movies like Freddy Krueger or any of these yeah. kind of things. 
my brothers all love that stuff, but I couldn't watch it. It was just like, fuck, it's going to make it hard for me to sleep at night. Mm. And then when I started sort of sensing someone or something in a space and it not being there or real, it made me afraid. I'd, I'd like get scared and face the wall and tuck my toes in the blankets and turn away because I'm like, oh shit, I don't want to fucking be a victim of a ghost or something like that. And and then when I ask my aunts, you know, who are, who are psychics and all that kind of say, oh, it's a gift. We all have it. Wow. You know, uh, you just have to tell them not now and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I can't do that shit. You know what? I, I don't believe in any of it. I'm going to reject all of this. I'm going to say it's hallucinations. I believe in a, in, a, in a physical world and whatever science has come up with because that's the best that we've ever been. And that's how I, I rode through. Uh, my teenage years, and then even in my 20s when I'd wake up and I'd sense that someone was in the room and I'd see like a woman like fishing about in a, at, in a dresser drawer or, or, or this person or that person, a young person, a person who looks like they're in their 30s, a woman holding her child, and I'd assume they're real people in my space, and then they turn out not to be real. I was like, ah, oh, it's fucking hallucinations. I, I thought it was maybe because... I left a, a, a jacket yeah. on, on uh, the and it looked a certain door, way. and it looked a certain yeah. way and my yeah. imagination takes it there. Mm-hmm. So I stopped putting jackets and towels on Dude. things and stuff like that and and um, and I found that it's it, it, it worked even then that I would sense it. I could be turned and facing a wall and I would wake up. I'd be in that and that it's it's that in between state. It's like um, you, you guys look young, you know, uh, but like back in the day, like cable, sometimes you'd be flipping channels and you get that channel that you don't have and it come through the static a bit. Mm-hmm. You could kind of be in an in-between place where you're half conscious and half not and, and sort of hang out there. You could sort of surf there, like a, the way a surfer rides a wave. You go there for a period of time and if you can stay calm and stay connected to what's happening, you could sort of be in it. And for a while, I was encountering that in my 20s, but I didn't want to believe in any of that shit. I didn't want to be some out there type of person. I rejected it. And, and all the while was painting graffiti as, as a rebellious act. I was very angry at the world. I felt like uh, I didn't even want to do art for a living. I, I saw, saw it as almost like prostitution, like selling my soul, selling a, a, a very deep part of myself for money i i I was very anti-money and i was very anti this and i was very anti that and i ended up in jail with like a like a hundred thousand dollar bail in new jersey in 19 uh end of 1998 and into 1999 and at a hundred thousand dollar bail i was working at sears and lost my job i was going to a community college for liberal arts because I didn't know quite know what to do but I love writing graffiti and I did a lot of it and I got arrested under the suspicion that I did it I was never caught in the act and when I was sitting there in jail I was in a a a special pod in that jail that it was a high bail because I had a high bail they put me in with murderers attempted murders high profile crimes high bails they all kind of were in this special place So, like, there was this one guy that execution-style murdered this one dude for his gold chain in front of his girlfriend, and he was serving us food, and then there was this other guy that was, like, a rapist, and then there was this other guy that I shared a cell with that sold all the drugs in the pond, uh, and he was getting it from a CEO through Little Debbie Snack Cake Cartons, and he was getting cash from these people, which they were smuggling in, too, and he started managing me how to do handkerchiefs and and write birthday cards for inmates and get commissary and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't belong there. I, uh, you know, like I was painting graffiti, you know, like I was, I was following, I was trying to figure myself out. I grew up broken, you know, I grew up displaced and, you know, uh, I didn't, you know, the guy, the guy in my cell, he arm robbed like eight banks between New York and New Jersey. And he said, the key to not getting caught is to smear lemon juice on your face before you go into the bank because it distorts your face on camera. No way. But he was there, you know, he was doing his thing. He was a real nice guy. You know, uh, I learned a lot. Um, but it was while I was in there that I had to make a decision about graffiti, you know, like my family and all of them. They would say, 
you know, when are you going to grow up? You know, uh, you're addicted, you know, graffiti is an addiction. Graffiti is not art. You need to do this type of thing in order for it to be considered art. You're wasting your talent. You're wasting your time. Look at what you're doing to your life. And I was sitting there in that time. I turned 19 during that time. And, uh, I made a decision. I said, I, I just sat with myself in this. It's like you go to sleep. I don't know if you've ever been in jail, but you go to sleep at night when you wake up, you're waking back up into the world and you look around and you're like, oh, fuck, I'm in jail. Like you just take a vacation from it for a while by going to sleep and you wake up, you realize you're back in jail. Uh, I, I had an epiphany that what I was so connected to was not an addiction. It was a passion that I should feel so fortunate to have something like this in my life. And that maybe the problem is that I'm rejecting the, the it. And it, if I can sort of bring this sort of passion into my life all the time, under whatever level of comfort I desire, well, then I'm living my best life. And I came out okay with the idea to make art uh, to earn a living, I, I accepted graffiti, what I was doing as art. Mm-hmm. And, and to do that, I was ex- accepting a major part of myself because I feel like there's just something in there when we, when we, when we deny that, that, that creative aspect of graffiti, we're denying a part of ourselves at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I let go of that and I, and I, and I put my, I put me on a, a path of not apologizing for who I am. And that, and that was, that's a big one. Yeah. Even, even me sitting here showing my face and all that kind of stuff. I ain't no Rico Suave looking motherfucker, but it is what it is. It's, it's a lot more inconvenient for me to put on a mask. You know, I'm not going to censor who I am for other people. If, if they don't approve, that's cool. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm learning to be comfortable in my skin, tuned into whatever radio station suits me at the time. I I have a very eclectic taste in music, you know, uh, and I'm not bound to the radio anymore. I have Spotify <laughs> and, and I'm down with Spotify. I make playlists for when I'm painting in the studio, hanging out with my, my friends, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, we, we, we just can't listen to one genre. We just can't listen to one. Yeah. We just can't eat one type of food. You, you ever meet those dudes that they only eat one sort of yeah. particular cuisine and that's it? Mm-hmm. That's fine for some people it works but for me I'm I'm a free bird man you know I you know I like I like to go through those shifts day to day you know Did I answer the question? I don't know if I, I went off topic. What the yeah. question was but <laughs> I think uh, it was answered was, perfectly. Yeah though that was amazing. Um <laughs> so what do you have planned now for I guess uh for I guess the future because you just came you just came back from the roadmap tour you were doing a bunch of traveling um, mm-hmm. in the physical realm, traveling all across America, yeah. living like a kind of, you know, I was just at, um, I was just at a, a jujitsu gym training and uh, my coach is like, he used to write graffiti when he was younger. He actually um, stopped because he fell off of a huge building and had like a pretty severe spine injury mm-hmm. um, when he was younger. And I told him that you were coming on the show and about how you had just done this and this and then you were in france beforehand and then about gardening and then about like all this stuff and i realized while i was saying it like holy shit like this doesn't sound normal at all yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it sounds kind of crazy i was yeah. saying it all back to back and i was yeah. like oh this sounds pretty like pretty out of the ordinary so do you have anything uh planned that's coming up do you do you plan stuff because it seems like you go off of like i said feeling and intuition intuition so intuition you know we can be brave enough to fall into the flow of ourselves for a while and trust that it will take us where we need to go that we don't need to measure everything you know uh, when i cook when i cook i i know the rice is done because i can smell it's done you feel it Mm. you know it's a game you know it's a game every day the more you can bring in feeling into your life the better you get at it you know the the absence of feeling it's 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 a very cold Mm. dead world and in some ways, there's an instigation to that we are doing to ourselves because all of this stuff, you know, the the they, you know, we say, oh well, they they are planning this. There there are these people that are all plotting to do this to that. You know, there's this what is it, Agenda Twenty One, or there's this thing or that thing. They 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 they. But but you know, we are an aspect of of that as well. Mm-hmm. We are they. Mm-hmm. 
all of us, we are they, and and at the same, you know, and and then it's the fear. It's like, oh well, if I if I go down, you know, committing to my morals, beliefs, I, you know, I the possibility of being jailed or or or, or being ruined or, or dying or any of these kind of things. These things trap us into just sort of going against our intuition, going against uh, our better judgment. Um, compromising our morals, you know. Uh, there, there are people that maybe they they don't want to murder anyone, you know, but they sign up to the military because it offers college, you know. And then maybe they go through a, an experience that doesn't quite feel like Rambo or Commando or whatever, you know. It, it's it's very personal, you know. And 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 sometimes that hurts. Sometimes that stays with you. You know, and 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 then and then people go that path, and it's an important path to 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 love and respect. You know, uh, and 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 anything rooted in trauma. I, I'm I'm super appreciative for all the experiences of trauma that I've had in my life because it's feelings. I think at the end of the day, when we're done with this world, and we step outside and we say, "Okay, how do I feel about that one?" You know, uh, we might appreciate all of it. Mm. You know, we might appreciate all of it, you know, all of it as lessons, all of it as experiences. You know, uh, I feel that the only thing we take from us in this life is experiences. Yeah, we don't we don't take the the, the houses or, or the bank accounts or this thing. We could leave them to some people. We could be really kind and leave them to people we feel are extensions of ourselves, family or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah, if... I have these. I have these shoes over here. These, uh, I have these New Balance shoes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here, and I just can't wear. I have other shoes, but I won't wear them. I wear the New Balance shoes, you know. And these are not even the New Balance I like. I got to go to a New Balance store and get these particular pair of New Balance yeah. that they're just my shoes. You know what I mean? And but they beat the fuck up. They got a lot of experiences in them and all that kind of stuff. But I don't care, you know. Like mm -hmm. like I've been wearing these pants for a couple of days now. Huh? I'm fine with it. I'm comfortable. I got I got money to buy fucking a quadrillion pair of pants. But it be what it be. I'm in it for the experiences. I get to hang out with my dad. You know, we go eat after. Hey, dad, you still awake? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we go eat after. And and I just roll with it, you know. Uh, when, when a current takes us out to sea, we could fight it and potentially drown. Or we could just sort of stay calm and, and, and just stay afloat and just be with it. And eventually it'll take us back to shore. Mm. Yeah. Well said. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show and speaking about your story, speaking about uh, the things that you've learned over a lifetime. Um, I'm definitely going to re-listen to this. And yeah. I've taken a lot from it. So thank you again. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. You, for us. I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. I, I've, I've listened to quite a few of your episodes and... I think the, the, the pace that you go on and, and, and your ability to get people to sort of um, uh, open up, uh, you, you're on the right path. Um, I enjoy it. I, I, I hope to see you do more. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I don't even know. Some things are, yeah. can't even explain them. But I, I, I appreciate <laughs> this gra conversation. And graffiti, you know, and graffiti yeah. is, is a wonderful one too. You know, I love, yeah. like the, to answer just, just to chuck in a question about graffiti is like, how do I, how do I find peace in, in writing in places where I'm not supposed to, painting in places where I'm not supposed to? I don't know. You just kind of figure out a balance. You know, a lot mm. of times there's something that I might have written on a few years ago that I might not now. Mm. I have a little bit of compassion for things. I tend to not write on things if it's like if I could tell somebody just buff their truck. Yeah. Like, oh, man like to but nah maybe i'll just let that side you could tell these people who are just desperately trying to keep their shit clean mm -hmm. you know um but i love it I, I i really do think that the world needs that that humanity needs graffiti it's been an essential part of who we are in understanding ourselves it, it is a written record to understand cultures far removed we know about the the you know, uh, the humans that were in caves based off of what they did to mark their space or in, 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 in uh, pyramids or temples or, or whatever it may be. We know about, you know, the, the, the 1600s through paintings, through sculpture, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I see graffiti as being a very important thing. And 
um, if I could just inject one, one more thing, yeah, dude, and uh, I'll say that. So what I where I'm at now, just to be transparent, is I, I've really come into channeling. I understand that just being an artist, that you're you're already doing it. You're already connecting to something, and if you lose yourself in that, you're stepping outside of yourself, and you bring something in that's surprising, surprising to others and to yourself at the same time. You're like, oh shit, you just bump into mm. things, you know. Uh, I feel that you know painting started. I started writing graffiti in 1991, and it's this practice sometimes where you're painting in the dark, low lit situations where you can't tell one color from the next. Right. You're painting in uncomfortable places, whether it be weather wise or, or maybe you're standing uh, on on a ledge, or you're painting under pressure with people looking at you or having to rush out or dealing with potentially dying, like stepping on a third rail or any of these kind of things that we're mm. thrilled by. Uh, but create, being able to create in a confident way under pressure, uh, it helped me to be able to channel. So like if I go into a deep meditation within myself and I can sort of slip into that in-between space where I'm half here and half not, and I fall into that imagination rhythm and I feel like there's something coming through or being said to me or, or an idea that just sort of comes in like, like, like in a snap, that I could hold it, that I could sort of stay in that difficult place for a while or that weird place for a while and work with it and, and, and just sort of bring it in. So like when I will go and sit and say a medicine ceremony, like on New Year's I was sitting doing ayahuasca in the dark is completely, there was just a little, you know, uh, we were in a yurt and there was just a little uh, window at the top and it's tremendously hard to see. And you're in the most deepest of connections to the earth itself through the spirit of these, these plants. Uh, but I, I'm able to hold that state, you know, I'm able to sort of be uncomfortable in the dark mm. and bring something through that comes out seamlessly without a pencil or without me pondering it, I feel like a, a stenographer. Mm. I feel like it's just coming through me and I just let go of my sense of self and it and it's just spelled out for me. And what comes out are these understandings and, and a lot of them are rooted in universal truth. And I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just me, I'm just Joseph and all that kind of stuff. I pull from it, I grow from it, I learn from it, and it's fun. It's like, oh wow, that's that's kind of out there. It's it's thrilling, like graffiti, mm. you know, to be able to, you know, like the magic of of painting something at night uh, is fully realized when you return to it the following day. Like if you painted like a really dark underpass and you couldn't see shit, and then you come back and you could see red is red, yeah. and and this thing, and you miss yeah. this fill or that fill, mm. the magic is there, mm. and it's like how how far can I go in a, in a difficult circumstance? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. with all this stuff, I, I, I do believe that channeling is possible and graffiti was my training to be able to work in, in, in difficult states. Mm. Well, well, well said. Yeah, well 100%. Said. Um, yeah. Like I said, immense thank you and uh, it was an honor for us. So thank yeah. you for coming here. And, and Yeah, man. I think yeah. people, we honestly will be super yeah. hyped and it was very different from a, uh, from, most of our talks with a lot of graffiti writers, but different mm -hmm. in like a super good way. And I think yeah. that there's a lot to be learned and things to just consider. Yeah. Like I'm uh, just hearing this, like I've been kind of in my own head as well, mm -hmm. thinking about certain ways I can apply it to my life or yeah. just even some things you say that maybe, maybe like in the first moment when you say them, maybe I don't agree with them, but then I'm like thinking about like how I don't agree with them. And then maybe I'm like, well, maybe he has a point and like why, why don't I agree with that? Maybe it's because of some way that I am or some way. And it's just making me think. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming yeah. on the show. In, in a world where everything is also nothing, the answer is always yes. You know, that, that, that's really it, is when you step into the infinite sea of imagination, all is possible yeah. and happening at yeah. the same time. It mm -hmm. steps out of timeline. You know, uh, uh, 
if if you go into your head at night and you you want to start dreaming or or daydreaming about a particular thing, maybe you're interested in a person or maybe you're thinking about what you did earlier, what you're going to do tomorrow, whatever, you could sort of have like an internal experience about yeah. it. And I feel that this existence, the sea of imagination is sort of doing that. So if we can if we can think it up then yeah, sure, why not? And when you step over and you you go through that that sort of fictitious uh, veil of being alive and mm -hmm. dead and you sort of play around there you understand that this is all just an experience and that we're in it for experiences and you know maybe we could have more than one experience and you know maybe we could just be comfortable with it all and 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 and, and be here to instigate a good time yeah and that's what I'm here to do I'm inst here to instigate a good time and I love graffiti so much. I love all the people, you know, that, that I've learned from along the way in it. I, I very much am a student of it. I am, I, I do feel that I'm, I'm a master of the craft and I kind of hit that ceiling for a while and I said, well, where to go from here? And it's kind of like college for the people that have been to college. You, you go, you get your bachelor's, you get your master's, then you get your doctorate. You know, and then beyond that, you know, like once you get into your doctorate, you got to kind of contribute something. Mm. And um, in order to do that, you have to learn everything just to be good enough at letting it go. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at now is is I'm I'm finding the ability to see some of these out there things in a logical way, mm. but but at the same time not because it's all imagination, and I'm just down yeah. with it. Oh, it's it's amazing yeah. because. You know what you're teaching, what you what you talked about on the show today, it you know graffiti you could say is just like a physical thing, but what we're talking about is kind of builds the foundation of a person, mm -hmm. their character, their identity, and from that they can create their graffiti. You know what yeah. I mean? So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Yeah. We could be in a place where instead of it coming from us, mm -hmm. it could come through us, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where I'm at now. Is I I just. I just let it go. Like when I'm talking to you guys, I don't quite know what I'm going to say or how I'm saying it. I just, it's like people who freestyle, you know, like people who do like freestyle rapping yeah, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. You know, you just, you just get into that. You just tune into it and then you just, you just ride it out, you know, and you trust, you trust that whatever it is, 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 is important and fun and, 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 and worth getting wrong every once in a while, you know, um, uh, you know, you can't land all your your tricks, but if you if you're not afraid, you know, eventually, you know, it'll surprise you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. My pleasure. Peace. Peace.